For so many, the borough of Stepney was the Jewish East End. But how many, I wonder, were aware of the wide area it covered north from the River Thames? The eastern end of Stepney's boundaries began at Bow, close to the La Boheme Cinema on the corner of Bedette Road and the Mile End Road. They went past the London Hospital in Whitechapel, reaching the city with its western border in Orgate at Middlesex Street, perhaps better known as Petticoat Lane. Oddly enough, Petticoat Lane had the honour of being in the borough of Stepney and the City of London at the same time. The boundary line, more or less, ran down the middle of the market. Stepney was on the east side where Wentworth Street entered the main market. On the opposite pavement, in the City of London, was Barnet's the Butchers, famed for supplying kosher meat to Queen Victoria when Lord Rothschild came to dinner. Its southern border, you could cruise along it from the Tower of London, keeping close to the north side. The south bank was in Southwark, not Stepney. Sailing on eastwards, you would pass Wapping, Shadwell, Limehouse, and part of the East India docks, all within the borough. Now to the northern side. Victoria Park was not in Stepney. The boundary was a ragged line running just south of the park and Bethnal Green Road, stretching out to Spitalfields Fruit Market, with Hawksmoor's magnificent church and gardens, providing a haven for the local drunken down-and-outs. No wonder, then, this greenery was known as Itchy Park. Today, the borough's name of Tower Hamlets cannot take away the memories and nostalgia of the highways and byways of Stepney. For more reasons than one, gardeners at the junction of the main White Chapel and Commercial Road thoroughfares was its symbolic image. Here it was that the fascists were not allowed to parade through the East End. But to get into the heart of the Jewish community of those bygone days, we can do no better than leave behind us the once upon a time magnificent Wickham's department store in the Mile End Road, go down the turning the blue car is leaving. Now let us pass the terraced houses, walking towards the leafy trees and the ivy-clad homes of the village, of Stepney Green. Village of Stepney Green, do me a favour, I'd like to see another village with such massive buildings like our Stepney dwellings. I was born there in 1918. There I spent my first 15 years with my parents, my three brothers and my four sisters. Ten of us sharing five rooms in the kitchen. Let me tell you something. Naturally, of course, we had to have the penthouse suite right up on the fifth floor. If I was in, I'd have a white schmatter flying from the balcony. My friends would knock the daylight out of me if they had to slap up all those five flights only to find I was out. Looking back now, we had no right to complain. The nearby streets had some of the worst slums in the East End. I can assure you they didn't have an inside lavatory like we did. We seldom played in the street. We had our own playground in the buildings. The gardens were for our parents and adults. God help us if the park keeper caught us playing there. He'll kill us. By the way now, you are looking at Dunson Houses on the other side of the green. See that date, 1899? Child and United Synagogue built our buildings. Thank God they replaced some of the pretty horrible hovels Jewish forced to live in when so many came after the Russian pogroms in the 1880s. Let's cross back again over the green from Dunstan Buildings to the imposing large house to the left of the tree. Some say Samuel Pepys wrote part of his diaries here. Today, the borough puts the building to good use for a number of its public and educational services. But the modern luxury block of flats on its right, partly blocked by the tree, stands in the very spot where 60 years ago you may have been grateful for the services of the London Jewish Hospital. The question has often been asked, why, why was it necessary to have a separate hospital for Jewish folk in the East End? After all, 
less than 10 minutes walk away in the Whitechapel Road was the London Hospital, one of the country's largest voluntary hospitals. Lord Rothschild was a governor, a generous benefactor. It met the reasonable religious needs of the Jewish community. So what brought the London Jewish Hospital into being? The movement for the hospital began early in 1907 in the Sydney Street basement flat of Isaac Berliner. Berliner, a poor struggling barber, came to England from Poland around 1895. He was strictly orthodox, but falling seriously ill, he was taken not to the London hospital, but to a nearby workhouse-type infirmary. For Berliner, the frightening non-Jewish atmosphere only aggravated his illness. His anguish convinced him that there had to be a Jewish hospital with Yiddish-speaking staff from surgeon to the front door porter. Committees were formed, meetings called, but it was only halfpennies and pennies and sixpences which were collected. But Lord Rothschild became worried. It became known the millionaire Bernatos, former EastEnders themselves, might donate £250,000 to Berliner. Rothschild objected. His London hospital met all Jewish requirements, and in his opinion, a separate Jewish hospital would be divisive. Soon it was a battle. Lord Rothschild versus the barber. Rothschild with all the archdukes of the Jewish establishment against the barber from Sydney Street. In 1909, the Jewish Chronicle suddenly reversed its initial opposition to Berliner. It urged the wealthy, support the Jewish hospital. But very little financial help was forthcoming, not even from the Bernatos. Berliner's London Jewish Hospital Association was soon negotiating with Charrington's, Stepney's famous brewers, to buy a site in Stepney Green, even though financially they were a long way from the required deposit. One fundraising scheme offered 22,000 shares at 10 and sixpence each, and each share purchased one square foot of land for the hospital. But it was the constant flow of the pennies from the poor, the street collections, the charity boxing matches, and the whist drives which enthused Berliner and his supporters to carry on the fight to the hospital. Then the Sephardi senior rabbi, the Haham, Dr. Moses Gaster, impressed by the determination of the EastEnders, vigorously campaigned for Berliner. Gaster attacked the Jewish establishment. They are either ignorant or hard-hearted, and their attitude is a tyrannical interference with the sympathies of the poor Jew of the East End. Yet in spite of the First World War and other setbacks, the hospital's foundation stone was laid in November 1915. By May 1919, some 12 years after the first meeting in the basement of Berliner's home in Sydney Street, the London Jewish Hospital opened its doors, but only to outpatients. The inpatient wards with the original 21 beds were opened two years later by none other than Lord Rothschild. But this Lord Rothschild was the son of that very same nobleman who battled with all his might to stop the barber from Sydney Street establishing his Jewish hospital in Stepney Green. Isaac Berliner died in December 1925, aged about 54. The Jewish Chronicle described him as a humble man working in a humble environment who managed to carve for himself a monument of which any prince might be proud. Without him, the movement would probably never have started. The 120-bed hospital attracted first-rate staff, had first-rate facilities, and its unique Jewish atmosphere helped patients on the road to recovery. The hospital closed in October 1979. The last surgical patient was George Challoner. Like so many who were cared for at the London Jewish over its 65 years, George belonged to another faith. In 1985, the London Jewish was demolished to make way for a new private hospital. From time to time, Jewish patients make use of its medical services. Yet, with all its excellent facilities and professional expertise, I am not quite sure whether Isaac Berliner would feel at home there. By now, I'm sure you know this is not one of Kensington's exclusive garden estates, but today's Stepney Green, where the Jewish hospital used to be. Look through the uprights of the open iron gate to the green. This building today is the Rosalind Green Hall, 
the headquarters of the Arba Youth Club. It specializes in, in training youngsters in the noble art of fisticuffs. I wonder how many of you, as you look carefully at this view of the Arba Youth and Boxing Club, will be able to recognize this building. This was the Stepney Orthodox Synagogue. In November 1940, it was badly damaged in the air raids on East London. After the war, the synagogue, against the wishes of the Federation executive, spent a lot of money restoring the shul. But so few of its regular worshippers remained. Like its neighbor, the Jewish hospital, the synagogue buildings were sold late in the 1970s. The air raids of World War II devastated much of the East End. In Stepney Green, one outstanding institution defied Hitler's blitzkrieg, the Stepney Jewish School. The school's historic beginnings go back to the 1870s, but it is a school from the 1930s which brings back so many emotive memories for twin sisters Sylvia Schneider and Frieda Hewson. Well, over 60 years ago at the Stepney Jewish, Sylvia and Frieda were far better known by their family name as the Balabon twins. You had me worried just now. I thought for a moment you had me in the wrong school. The photo gives the impression that boys and girls were in the same class. No way was this possible at Stepney Jewish. Boys were definitely out. It was different in the infant school. The boys and the girls were together. But as soon as they went into the junior school, we were kept apart. Didn't help much, though. The boys used to throw love notes over the playground wall. Once I left rather a naughty invitation from one of the boys in my coat pocket. I didn't know my mother was going to take my coat to Perkins for cleaners. They took the note out of the pocket and gave it to her. I can tell you that that was one occasion glad my mother couldn't read English. Our head teacher, Kate Rose, was very strict on discipline. Our school uniforms had to be spotless. She'd look at our shoes, inspect our hands and fingernails. All had to be absolutely clean. And our educational standards for arithmetic, composition were pretty high. Then we had separate lessons for spelling, poetry, music, and of course Hebrew and religious instruction. Plenty of Hebrew grammar too. I can still remember the conjugations. Kol, Nifal, Pial, Puel, Hifal, and Hitpal. I wonder how many kids in Jewish day schools today can do that. It was a fantastic school. I loved every moment of it. Sylvia told you we didn't have much to do with the boys, but we often had our morning assemblies together. One of the teachers was Chaim Lipschitz. As you look at the photo, he's the tall man at the end of the second row on the right. He took us the music and played the piano at assembly. But more important, he was one of the founders of Habanim. He started it in Stepney. It became the largest Zionist youth movement throughout the whole world, not just in England. My favorite, though, was Fanny Levine. She was such an inspiring teacher. She really cared for all her pupils and never forgot any of us. Fanny Levine married Rabbi Israel Brody. He became our chief rabbi. It was during the 1940s, the terrific fire blitz over London, I met Fanny Levine in an air raid shelter. I was now married. She threw her arms round me and said, you're one of the Balabon twins. I hadn't seen her for over six years since I left school. She was so friendly. You can imagine we were so excited when Rabbi Brody was honored with a knighthood. There's no doubt Lady Brody was certainly a lady. And she was a lady in every sense of the word. When we last went down Stepney Green, the old school buildings were still there. 
The boys' gateway with the initials SJS of the school remain. The entrance to the girls' and infant school are also there, but today you will no longer see youngsters willingly or not so willingly going to school. In 1970, the buildings were sold, bought by a group of creative painters and artists. They transformed the halls and classrooms into studios. Harry Borkin, who taught as Stepney Jewish from the 1950s, played a major part in transferring the school to Ilford. When the Second World War ended, Kate Rose brought the children back from evacuation at Windsor. Stanley Rostin soon took over as the head teacher. But by the mid-1960s, about a third of the pupils were not Jewish. Fewer and fewer Jewish families were living in Stepney. They moved to the suburbs, and so many of them went to Ilford. Looking back now, the decision to move was a wise one. And for me personally, as one of the early head teachers at Ilford Jewish Primary, for me it was an honor and privilege to help bring many of those old Stepney traditions to the new school. And those old traditions, with all their nostalgic memories, are still very much with us. You should see what happens when the old boys and girls from the Stepney school come together for their lively reunions. And let me tell you the story of a particularly lively old boy from the good old days. The name of this personality, surrounded by pupils at Ilford Jewish Primary, was Boris Winogradsky. We need to go back some 75 years. This is Boris's class at Stepney Jewish, about the year 1921. Look at the top left-hand corner. Boris, the first boy, on the left, with the teacher standing behind him. There was good reason why the teacher was keeping close to Boris, but soon after this photo was taken, Boris was expelled. He had been running a football sweepstake at a halfpenny near time among his classmates. Four years later, a young entrepreneur began to dance his way out of poverty to stardom. Boris Winogradsky of the East End now became Bernard Delfont of the West End. Fifty years on, he was honored with a knighthood. By then, this old boy was running a chain of 300 cinemas. He owned eight theaters, numerous hotels, and employed over 12,000 people. His obituary in the Jewish Chronicle, 5th of August, 1994, is surely a fitting tribute to the lad from the Stepney Jewish School, who brought much joy and happiness to so many people around the world. Over 100 years before Bernard Delfont went to Stepney Jewish School, another of its pupils, Joseph Frederick Stern, was destined to make an historic impact on the area. For this youngster was to become Reverend Joseph Stern, Minister of the East London United Synagogue from the late 1880s until the early 1930s, a ministry spanning some 40 years. Stern's appointment was made in 1887, 11 years after the synagogue was first opened. It was at the frightening time when thousands of persecuted Jews were fleeing Tsarist Russia, arriving penniless at the London docks, with so many of them crowding into the slum areas of Spitalfields and Stepney. Judge Israel Feinstein, a former president of the British Board of Deputies, has researched the story of Reverend Stern for a paper to the Jewish Historical Society of England. No one was more keenly aware of the community's responsibility to help these impoverished immigrants than Stern. It may well be that he was not a master of rabbinical scholarship, but for the vast majority of the Yiddish-speaking congregants in his part of London, with so many of them seeking his help to settle their newly arrived relatives in Stepney, Stern was the very prototype of the pioneering pastoral caring ministry in the United Synagogue. You could say he was their social welfare and housing officer, helping them through their many problems at local level and at government level. The evidence makes it clear that he considered it a priority to help the Yiddish-speaking youngsters to absorb the English way of doing things, 
It was through his close involvement with the neighbouring Stepney Jewish School that the East London Synagogue was the very first United Synagogue to provide special separate religious services for children. This became an example for other United Synagogues. I would add that it was this approach on his part which greatly encouraged the Jewish scouts and club movements in Stepney. And let us not overlook his active support for the Stepney Literary and Social Society, an important body in those days. That society encouraged young students and young intellectuals to come forward and be heard. One of its members was Zelig Brodetsky, who, as is well known, later became president of the Board of Deputies and thereafter president of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. The well-known author and Yiddishist Joseph Leftwich was also a member of that society in his younger days. Stern's cooperative relationship with non-Jewish bodies and non-Jewish clerics certainly contributed to the recognition that was accorded to him in 1929 when he was awarded the CBE. It was an award given not only for his services to his own community, but for the whole of the life of his part of London. Clearly, he sought to anglicise the newcomers, but he also sought to strengthen the role of Judaism in their lives. He regarded that combination as beneficial to the Jewish community, as well as helpful to the immigrants themselves and to their families. I was ten when Reverend Stern died in 1934. We used to call him the Bishop of Stepney, but for me, there was no other shore in the whole of the East End, not even the great in Duke's Place, which compared with our East London synagogue. And that enormous bimmer, Chazam Fuchsman, with his brilliant voice, brought in worshippers from all over London. There was talk of him being the Chazam at Duke's Place. But he was a pretty small chap, five feet tall, he had to be raised on a special platform, otherwise you'd never see him. But the great turned him down. He wasn't tall enough for them. Right at the back of the shawl, with the ladies' gallery on either side, was our choir gallery. You'll probably think I'm boasting. I was in that choir for many years. But in the thirties, it was by far the finest shawl choir in London, and for good reason. It was a mixed choir. There were over 60 of us. The girls were on the left, we were on the right. The mixed choir started in Stern's day. And Chief Rabbi Hertz, bless him, when he frequently came to East London, he never asked us to change our tradition to an all-male choir. Talking about choirs, of course we had to go on strike, but not for money. They tried to stop us playing football outside the shore when they were reading the law on Shabbos. So we walked out and transferred ourselves to the shul choir in nearby Jubilee Street. We soon went back though. I think we missed the girls. <laughs> you know, after the Second World War, Many members moved to the suburbs, but for their weddings, they'd be back in East London. I wonder how many choppers have had a guard of honour from the local Jewish scout troop. Here, let me pay my tribute to the Reverend Zeffert. He's the bareheaded gentleman, shaking hands with the youngsters. He became our minister of Reverend Stern, and like Reverend Stern, his Yiddishkeit had a very human approach. And this is one of my favourite reminders of my old shawl. Here, Reverend Zeffert is under the chuppah, marrying his son, my good friend Stanley, to Lily Gertler. That was in 1950. I was married there in 1948. In 1977, the East London United Synagogue celebrated its 100th anniversary. The officiating clergy were the then Chief Rabbi Dr. Emmanuel Jakobowicz, the Emeritus Chief Rabbi Sir Israel Brody, the synagogue's minister, Reverend N. Bergerman, assisted by Reverend A. Baum, with Reverend Simon Hass officiating as Chazan. 
The choir consisted of male choristers only. In December 1987, some ten years later, the last service was held in the main cinema. The dwindling Jewish community in Stepney could no longer sustain the cost to the United Synagogue for maintaining one of anglo jewish historic religious buildings. It was sold on the commercial market for development purposes. The public house, the Bricklayer's Arms, is just a few hundred yards away from the desolate remains of the East London Synagogue. Where the block of flats stands today, there, behind the pub, 100 years ago, was the location of a new imaginative Hebrew and religious classes, the Redmond's Road Talmud Torah. The innovative teaching methods used by the Talmud Torah stirred a strange controversy involving Chief Rabbi Herman Adler's Beth Din. Monty Richardson, one of Anglo Jury's leading communal workers, was a pupil at Redmond's Road. I was ten years old when I received this certificate from my Hebrew studies. Now let me assure you, this is no ego trip on my part to demonstrate what a clever little boy I was, but it was the Hebrew line at the top of the certificate, Talmud Torah Ivrit Ivrit which was at the very heart of the battle in our Hebrew classes, which made it necessary to go to the chief rabbi for a ruling. In 1901, when Redmond Road opened, Theodor Herzl's four-year-old Zionist organization was making an impact on world Jewry. Herzl, the Zionist leader, had visited England. He met the principal of our Talmud Torah, Reverend J. K. Goldblum and he became an ardent Herzl supporter. At that time, though, very few Zionist leaders and delegates to the Zionist Congresses could speak Hebrew, but Reverend Goldblum and most of his staff were determined that the old Cheder method of learning Hebrew by rote no longer had a place in the struggle for strengthening Judaism and Jewish culture. The living language of Hebrew, as in Palestine, was to be the Hebrew in Redmond's Road. And incidentally, not just for reading, but for doing Talmud, for doing Mishnah, for doing the Tanakh, for doing modern Jewish history right up to modern days. Jewish history did not end with the destruction of the Second Temple. Some of the teachers and committee members were bitterly opposed to the idea. They wanted nothing to do with modern spoken Hebrew. Indeed, they considered it a chilol Hashem, a desecration of the holy tongue, the Russian Kurdish. And in good East End style, the opponents of the Palestine Hebrew even went so far as to bring some of the pupils out on strike, supported by their parents. Before Chief Rabbi Adler and his court, the arguments raged. A compromise was reached. It was ruled that the teaching of Hebrew as a modern language was permissible, but only on the condition that the pronunciation of the Hebrew must keep to the old Ashkenazi tradition. It was not to be Talmud Torah Ivrit Be'ivrit, but Talmud Torah Ivris Be'ivris. But 47 years later, by the time the State of Israel was reborn on the 14th of May 1948, the Redmond's Row Talmud Torah Choir, under its director Eric Wolkenfeld, was leading the celebrations with Israeli songs in impeccable Israeli Hebrew. I can tell you that on that day there was many a rejoicing voice which had had its early training in the Reverend Goldblum's Talmud Torah in our Stepney. <laughs> In 1961, in Jerusalem, J.K. Goldblum was laid to rest. He had reached the golden age of 91. And in the 1960s, Redmond's Road itself, once the thriving thoroughfare for so many of its Jewish residents, with the Talmud Torah and its synagogue, and the high proportion of Jewish children at the Redmond's Road State School, the neighborhood was fast becoming a home for new immigrants. And just like the Jewish community before them, 
they too were struggling hard to safeguard their way of life and religious identity. And as they entered Jubilee Street, I doubt whether they would be aware that the white painted building up for sale on the corner of Lindy Street was where the Jubilee Street Great Zionist Synagogue stood before being blitzed in World War II. This was the show where in the 1930s Monty Goldstein, with his striking comrades from the East London Synagogue Choir, rallied to make their defiant stand against their board of management. I also doubt very much whether even Monty Goldstein was then aware that next door to the shul were the offices of the revolutionary anarchist Yiddish newspaper, the Arbeiter Freund. After the war, a smaller rebuilt Jubilee Street synagogue had its entrance around the corner in Lindley Street. Just like the Stepney Orthodox in Stepney Green, the migration to the suburbs soon forced the shoe to close. It became the headquarters of AJY, the Association of Jewish Youth. The fading tablets over the one-time entrance to the rebuilt synagogue might still be there, but not the AJY. Now you will need to travel to Wembley if you wish to visit the HQ of Anglo Jury's largest youth organization. But all is not lost. Five minutes walk away from Jubilee Street you will be able to say your prayers at the one time Nelson Street Shul, now known as the East London Central Synagogue. It was in 1975 that Nelson Street Shul amalgamated with 18 other East End synagogues with declining memberships. The reconsecration took place in the presence of dignitaries Diane Fisher, Diane Kaplan and Diane Toledano with the lay leaders of the Federation of Synagogues led by Mr. Morris Lederman. And absorbed into the East London Central were some of the Federation's well-known communities, Cannon Street Road, Chevre Chasse of Old Montague Street, Commercial Road Great, Jubilee Street, New Road, and the three shoes in Philpot Street. Nelson Street runs across Philpot Street. The white building in the distance is part of the London Hospital Complex. Opposite the few remaining terraced houses which survived the German air raids would have been Philpot Street Synagogue, competing with Philpot Street Safadish and Philpot Street Romanian Schools. Today, the London Hospital Students' Hostel not only stretches across where Philpot Street Shul used to be, but has also taken over the Shul's neighbour, the Maldmay Christian Mission to the Jews. Few of the local Jewish folk would admit it, but they sometimes received better treatment at the mission than from their own local doctor. And whilst for some of you, bagel bunnies might be a rather odd combination indeed, I was told you could have bacon with your bagel bunny, I doubt whether the shock would have matched that of the Orthodox establishment when this photograph of a Yom Kippur service at Philpot Street appeared in the Daily Sketch. The Jewish Chronicle, in a leader dated 6 of October 1922, thundered, The impious desecration of religious observances involved, as well as the terrible degeneration in those who submit themselves for the mere love of publicity in the performance of what should be sacred duties, are too palpable to require any enlargement on our part. Some ten years later, there was no complaint when this panorama of mainly Federation East End ministers and Chazanim identified themselves to the community at large by wearing the non-Jewish clerical collar. The photograph was taken in the hall of the great synagogue duke's place. Composer and choirmaster Samuel Alman, in collar and tie, has the much-respected Reverend Mayrovich of the Great on his left. Sitting in the front row, first on the left, as you look at the photo, is Reverend Fuchsmann. Monty Goldstein told us how small he was, but his stature as a Chazan was certainly outstanding. Today, these old four-storied Victorian houses are close to the corner where, once upon a time, 
the Philpott Street Shul used to be. This is Ashfield Street. Some 50 years ago its name was Rutland Street. At the far end we enter Ford Square, one of four squares all within 10 minutes walking distance of Stepney Green. On the south side of the square there is a small Islamic religious school. Fortunately for the local Asian youngsters, there is no need for them to travel far for their fun and games. I am sure the choristers at the East London Synagogue way back in the 30s would not have gone on strike if they had facilities like this so close to their shul. But let's go further back in time to the early 1900s when Ford Square was just a patch of greenery gasping for survival in those smoke-ridden days. In one of the terraced houses on the left, with its gallery basement and cellar, Sammy Fisher grew up. Sammy, with his Eton collar in the front row, was a pupil at Rutton Street School. His childhood sweetheart, Millie Glackstein, lived just around the corner from Ford Square, and it would not surprise you to learn that the wedding ceremony was at Philpott Street Synagogue with, of course, photography by Boris at the famous studio in the Whitechapel Road. From their beginnings in Ford Square, Sammy and Millie eventually served as the Mayor and Mayoress of Stoke Newington, then the very first Mayor and Mayoress of Camden, with Sammy's increasing involvement at executive level with Jewish and non-Jewish bodies around the world. He became President of the Jewish Board of Deputies and eventually took his seat at the Palace of Westminster as a peer of the realm. The trees in the distance are in Ford Square, and as we continue to make our way along Ashfield Street, leaving behind us the square where the fishers grew up, you might feel that we have suddenly arrived in a country village. Today, Sydney Square on a sunny day is a pretty pleasant spot, and the ladies enjoying a relaxing chat would certainly not be discussing the conflicting views on the sensational drama in 1911 as to how and why the house at 100 Sydney Street became a blazing inferno. Winston Churchill, the then Home Secretary, was there with soldiers and policemen, but to this day there is still some doubt whether the criminals burnt to death at the siege of Sydney Street were a murderous gang of jewelry burglars who had killed three policemen, or a troublesome revolutionary group of European anarchists plotting some mischief. But there can be no doubt whatsoever that Sydney Street has been at the very centre of a number of exciting dramatic developments in the history of London's Yiddish theatre. For nearly the whole of 1944, the year the Allies returned to Europe to smash Hitler, the King of Lampedusa was playing daily to packed houses of Jewish and non-Jewish theatre-goers at the Grand Palais in the Commercial Road. Even with the severe wartime newsprint rationing, the national press and weeklies gave substantial coverage to the story how Royal Air Force Sergeant Sidney Cohen of Whitechapel single-handed conquered the tiny Italian island of Lampedusa. In a dream sequence, he brings in the ganze Mischbucher from the East End to administer the conquered territory. The curtain falls on a rapturous celebration as Britain declares that after the war, Palestine will be the Jewish state. It was in the Sydney Street home of director-actor Meyer Zelnicker the production was finally put together to make it the longest-running Yiddish show anywhere in the world. And if you're near Sydney Square, keep your eyes open. You may well be lucky enough to see actress Anna Zelnicka with her musician husband Phil taking a stroll. They live in Sydney Street, and in their flat, Plans were made in 1946 to invite Robert Atkins, the famous Shakespearean director from the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre, to direct Mayor and Anna as Shylock and Portia in London's first ever production of The Merchant of Venice in Yiddish. Atkins knew no Yiddish, but the 
brilliant translation by Abish Meisels was so true to the original that even the hardened theatre critics of the national press had nothing but praise for the production. Sydney Street, at its northern end, is at the crossroads where Mile End Road meets the Whitechapel Road. At its southern point, it reaches the commercial road spanning the whole borough from Docklands to Orgate. At Kelly's flower shop, we turn to our left. We are now walking in an easterly direction, passing the congregation of Jacob Synagogue. This is one of the four remaining East End shuls holding regular services, but less than five minutes' walk from the synagogue, just off the commercial road, was the police station in Arbuth Square so familiar to immigrant families in Stepney. In the early 1900s and into the 30s, my own parents, like many thousands who came from Europe, had to report there on their movements. On the opposite side of the square, Rain's Grammar School always had a large proportion of Jewish pupils. The school excelled in getting their students into university and the professions. In 1933, four six formers were awarded the highly prestigious Education Board State Scholarships. No other grammar school had ever achieved this record in a single school year. Today, Rain's Foundation is no longer a grammar school, but its motto, Come in and learn your duty to God and to man, remains engraved in stone on the portal above the building's entrance. We began our visit through the villages of Stepney by suggesting we should consider Stepney Green itself as the nostalgic heart of the Jewish East End. I'm sure some of you who lived in or close to Old Montague Street will in disgust explode with a deep-throated feh. <laughs> Others from Brig Lane, close to Machziki Hadas, would even question whether it is proper to consider Stepney Green as part of the Yiddish East End at all. And then, of course, there would be those who would insist that only Hessel Street Market, opposite the Grand Palais Yiddish Theatre, that market alone was entitled to be honoured as the heart of the Jewish East End. Well, perhaps you may well be right. But for old time's sake, let me take you to one more of the villages of Stepney, close to Stepney Green Underground Station, in search of that heart of the community, Bowman Grove. Bowman Grove is about 150 yards long, that's all. It brings you face to face with Bowman Square. The square itself is about the same size as Ford Square, Sydney Square and Arbor Square. And when you turn to your right, you will be facing the entrance to the London Independent Hospital, which backs onto Stepney Green, where some 16 years ago, as you will remember, the London Jewish Hospital had its front entrance. But as you now know, where the London Jewish used to be, a pleasant new private housing estate stretches alongside the gardens the children from the Stepney dwellings and the Stepney Jewish School were not allowed to play in. Today, it would be very difficult indeed to find any Jewish children at play in the Stepney of yesterday or in the Tower Hamlets of today. Of its 100,000 or so Jewish residents from before 1939, possibly 6,500 remain. For many of them, it is in the Bowman Grove Community Centre, so close to Stepney Green, where this Jewish heart continues to draw its strength and vigour from the traditions and memories of the villages of Stepney. Mm -hmm.